The most news in the morning. CNN's American Morning. Weekday, 6 a.m. Eastern. Iranian-American journalist Roxana Saberi has survived something that most of us cannot imagine. While working in Iran, she was detained and thrown in jail, convicted of spying for the U.S., a charge that she completely denies. She was released last May after an appeals court suspended her eight-year sentence. Well, now she's published her story in a new book called Between Two Worlds, My Life in Captivity in Iran. I had a chance to sit down with Roxana and asked her what happened on January 31st of last year, the day she she was arrested. So that day they took me to an unmarked building somewhere in Tehran and they interrogated me for several hours and um, it was a wide range of questions but the, it seemed like their focus was on a book that I was writing about Iranian society and they kept saying why did you interview these people or those people like why did you interview reformists and I said well I also interviewed conservatives and they basically said yeah you shouldn't have done that either and it seemed like everything that I had done, especially in relation to my book, they were sensitive about. And they said, um, who has copies? And I said, well, my mother does. And I emailed her copies. Does anybody else have copies? No. Um, uh, who's paying you to write this book? And I said, nobody. I'm paying it out of my own pocket. And they'd say, no, no. We know somebody's paying you to write it. And then in the end, I found out they were um, that day that they wanted me to say that the book was a cover for espionage for the United States, which is not true at all. Um, later on, I found out that they knew I wasn't a spy, but they were pretending to think so. Why do you think that they wanted to accuse you mm -hmm. of espionage, mm -hmm. even though you say they knew that you were not spying right. for right. America? They do this to a lot of people, uh, political prisoners and prisoners of conscience who were arrested for peacefully standing up for their rights. I think that they also wanted to get this false confession out of me, which they claimed was not false in the beginning. Um, because they also wanted to use it as, as blackmail against me because they wanted me to spy for them. They said this is one of the conditions for my release. What made you decide to confess in the first place? The pressure, psychological and mental pressure, um, was immense. Not only was I cut off from the world and I wasn't allowed to have an attorney, um, <clears throat> and I wasn't allowed to tell anyone my whereabouts and they had thrown me in solitary confinement and they said you're not getting out until you cooperate and confess to being a spy, um, even though that wasn't true. And then they started threatening um, also my family. They said we have agents in different parts of the world, we can also find your family. And they told me also I could stay in prison for 10 or 20 years until I became an old lady. Can you imagine what you'll look like when you're an old lady? And you know also espionage can result in the death penalty. So under all these pressures I thought well this is the way things work in Iran. Well, What did you think was going to happen to you? Did you think there was a chance you were going to be killed? Uh, yes, in the beginning definitely. Um, especially when I was cut off from the world and nobody knew I was there and my captors made sure of that. How torturous was this for your family as well? I mean your parents knowing that they were helpless to get you out of there? I think um, it must have been very difficult. Uh, they tried not to show it when they came to see me in prison because they knew that I wanted to see them happy. But one day my mom cried a lot and uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's a very emotional talk about. I think my parents were pillars of strength and patience and courage and without them it's very likely that I would still be in prison today. Well instead of making a wish I'm, I'm going to ask a question and my cellmate said okay and I said um, should I tell the truth? Um, in, my, in my mind it was should I recant my confession while I'm still in prison well, that could jeopardize my freedom because my captors had said, you'll be freed if you make this confession. Or should I wait till I'm free? And she opened the Quran and she said um, that it said, yes, do it. Even if you may suffer, in the end you will prevail. But you and took those words to heart. I did. And you did listen. Yeah. And so tell me uh, how you went about recanting your confession and the type of pressure you were under doing that. A lot of people don't recant, or they recant once they're freed, or they don't recant at all because they're scared of the repercussions, and I don't blame them at all, but this was just a decision that I wanted to make to know that, um, to prove to myself that I was no longer afraid 
no longer afraid of my captors, no longer afraid of death, no longer afraid of man. You also were put on trial, basically, convicted on espionage charges, and you were sentenced to eight years in yes. prison. You said, though, in your book that you thanked God when you heard eight years yes. as opposed to one or two. Yes. Why? I thought eight years, this, is, uh, this, this can be a good thing because if I had only gotten one or two years, there wouldn't be as much of an international outcry about it. And indeed, there was an outcry. And the whole trial was a sham anyway. And it proved to me that I would not expect justice. I could not expect justice in that system. So I became more determined um, and I went on a hunger strike at that point. And what was that like? You know, when you're so defiant and you believe in something strong enough, like you don't feel the pain when you're determined to do it. This was my only instrument, the only thing I could control in prison other than my attitude was my body. And it was the only tool I believed I had to put pressure on the authorities to give me justice and release me. What was the moment like when you were free, when you finally got to see your family again, when you knew that, you know, I'm safe now? I had told myself at one point in prison that I'm, uh, I'm not going to cry anymore until the day I'm free. And so when I left those prison gates and I, the prison disappeared behind me, I, finally I wept, but I realized that my tears were not just tears of joy, they were also tears of sorrow. Joys of at my freedom, but sorrow for those prisoners I was leaving behind. And that's a large reason that I wrote the book. And that's the interesting thing you point out in your book as well. 70% um, of the Iranian population under the age of 30, correct? Yes. And um, we saw the student protests. We uh -huh. saw the young people assemble. We saw the Green Revolution. We saw it on Twitter. Yeah. And all of these pictures and all this information. And then it seemed like the door was slammed shut on that. We don't yeah. know what happened yeah. after that. I yeah. mean, life clearly didn't return to normal. Right. But did anything change in Iran? I think that the country can never go back to the way it was before those June elections last year. Um, there's been a growing gap between the regime and a large part of society. And we've also seen a lot of divisions within the regime itself. Right now, a lot of people are scared. Uh, they've been scared into silence. Do you fear now that the long arm of Iran's authorities can reach you here in America? Um, sometimes I think about it. I don't like to use the word fear, but because I've, I tried to overcome you know, fear of death in prison, but sometimes, yes, and um, I'll, for example, walk down the street and look over my shoulder, or um, if I'm talking to somebody, I meet somebody new, sometimes I wonder, oh, could this be, person be an informant <laughs> for the regime? It's a horrible feeling. And um, I know that other political prisoners, many of them have felt the same way. But I don't know if I'm much of a priority for the regime right now. I think they have their hands full. She's a very brave young woman, very poised. Yeah, it, it's interesting that even here in America she's worried about that. And, and let's also forget, too, in the notorious prison in which she was held, there's still three other Americans, the hikers, yep. who don't know what their fate is going to be, charged with a, an offense that could bring the death penalty. So she, she illuminates a lot of what they must be going through now. Right, and she talks about the importance of this international pressure, about mm -hmm. all of the people fighting uh, for her and not letting her story um, you know, recede, and that's sort of what the hikers' families are trying to do right now as well. The other interesting thing about the hunger strike, she went down to 99 pounds uh, until they finally forced an IV, and uh, she said it was a phone call from her mother. Her mother said, you better start eating again, or I'm going to uh, go on a hunger strike. Hmm. And so she stopped. Yeah. Well, great read. Interesting read, her book.